Alright, so today we're going to be talking about probably the most important thing that we'll cover in this class, unfortunately, and that's climate change and how we'll focus on how it interacts with, you know, uh, geology, obviously, but we'll talk about some of the effects and why you guys should care. Probably many of you already do, but just to drive the point home. So this slide here is just to make the point that uh, climate change is not just necessarily warming. The Earth is warming overall, as we'll see, but it also causes extremes of temperature back and forth. So this is temperature records that were set on one single day, February 20th, 2015, from one single uh, weather system here. So in the southwest, there were record highs of the red dots, and then in the eastern part of the country, there were record lows that same day. So climate change is not just warming in general, although that is a big part of it. It also causes extreme fluctuations in weather to become more common. In fact, we're seeing all sorts of problems currently. So California fires out in not just California, but you know, out west in general have have been extremely prevalent and are becoming more prevalent over time. Um, there's 70,000 deaths were attributable to a heat wave in Europe in 2003, and the World Health Organization estimates that between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause an additional quarter million deaths, which is pretty horrible. Now, just to demonstrate, like, some, hopefully everybody here is, you know, convinced that climate change is a real thing, but just to, to put up the indisputable facts here. So we know that the planet as a whole is getting warmer. This is something, you know, we can measure temperature. It's, it's not interpretable, it's just what it is. And so the, out of the ten warmest years that have been tracked since 1880, the, like, here's the top rank here, right? So with the exception of uh, 2012 and 2011 are not in the top ten, I believe that they're 11th and 12th. Like 2016, 2015, 2017, 2018, 14, 10, 13, 5, 2009. Basically, like, you know, the, out of the last five years, those last five years have been the five hottest we've ever observed in 140 years of records, basically, at this point. And it's pretty remarkable. The other thing that we can measure directly without, you know, any kind of interpretive problems is the CO2 concentration, so the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is chart on the right. And it's been going up for a long time at this point um, in terms of human time scales, and it continues to grow to this day. So these are two things that, you know, we can measure and are indisputable. Now, the effect of increasing temperature means that sea level rise, sea levels rise, and that's because of melting ice caps, um, so like the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets, but also actually thermal expansion. So when you heat something up, it tends to expand. And so in the case of water, that happens. Like as you, you know, heat up the water in the ocean, it expands ever so slightly. Now it's not a ton, but when you're talking about the oceans, which cover, you know, 70% of the Earth's surface, like even a small increase in volume ends up being a lot of volume. And since 1900, the sea level has actually risen by 7 to 8 inches. And it's currently rising at a rate of, you know, a third of a centimeter per year, and it's expected to accelerate um, into the future. And it's expected to rise about 2 meters for every degree Celsius that the temperature of the Earth increases. So two meters is, that's a lot of increase. And in fact, the current warming puts about 137 million people at risk of things like flooding um, and other natural disasters. And a warming of two degrees C, which we're currently, you know, if nothing's done, basically on track to reach pretty quickly, like within your guys' lifetimes, definitely, um, puts another, you know, twice as many people at risk. And in fact, because there's a delay between the time when, like, the heating of the Earth goes into, like, the carbon dioxide goes in the atmosphere, which causes the heating, which we'll talk about in a minute, and when the sea level actually rises as it heats up, the amount of carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere, if we stopped, if, like, humans cease to exist tomorrow, and no more, you know, greenhouse gases that of us pump out into the the atmosphere, the sea level would continue to rise for several centuries and eventually would flood out in this chart over here, like 
New Orleans, a good chunk of southern Louisiana would be underwater, parts of the coast of Texas would be underwater, the southern tip of uh, Florida would be underwater, and then if 2 degrees Celsius warming, if we you know continue to let this kind of go as things are, a good chunk of southern Florida continues to be underwater, start to get parts of North Carolina and Virginia and South Carolina and Georgia, uh, basically a lot of the Gulf Coast starts to get flooded very quickly. Now, in the U.S., that's not super drastic. It's pretty nasty, but it's not super drastic. But other places in the world are basically facing obliteration already. So island nations out in the Pacific, uh, specifically the Maldives, Kiribati, and Tuvalu, are small island nations that are built mostly on coral atolls. And so they're only a few feet or tens of feet above sea level, typically. And so as sea level has risen, even the relatively modest well, not necessarily modest, but like the increases that have happened so far, maybe a few inches, um, are enough to get the waves up onto the land pretty far and destroy infrastructure. And then it's salt water in the ocean, so that salt water then starts to intrude via the groundwater of the islands and the wave action that destroys any crops or small sources of fresh water that are available on the islands. And it's forced countries to, to think about um, evacuating basically their nations, which will cease to exist. There won't be any land left for them to live on in the near future. So this picture on the bottom right is the former president or prime minister, I can't remember exactly what his title was, um, of the Maldives, holding a cabinet meeting underwater. He's signing a letter to the United Nations asking them, pleading basically for them to, to please uh, do something about climate change because Maldives alone can't, can't stop it at all, really, unfortunately. Now, it's not as if sea level and temperature haven't changed in the past. We know from the Earth's record that they've changed radically over time. And in fact, most of Earth's history, the planet has been quite a bit warmer and quite a bit of higher sea level than it is today. So the bottom left the picture on the bottom left over here, the red line is the current or near current uh, sea level from, let's say, like 1950. I think it is. And then... The blue squiggle here represents how high up or down the sea level has been historically over time, going from left oldest to right youngest modern day. And you can see, you know, back in, like, say, the Cretaceous, the sea level was 200 uh, feet higher than it currently is. Like, that's a lot. Uh, it's mostly been, you know, higher, right? There's only, there's a brief interval here in like the late Paleozoic, early Mesozoic when sea level was lower than it is today. But the vast majority of Earth history, it's, it's been quite a bit higher than it is today and also quite a bit warmer. So again, the center line on the picture on the right here is where kind of the global temperature uh, average was for say like around, around 1950. And you can see going back through time, like for the most part, it's to the right of that black bar, which indicates that it was warmer than it currently, well, than it was. And so we're actually still relatively cool compared to what historically has been the condition of the Earth throughout most of its history. Now our best records of climate change over geologic time periods are quite young, uh, typically less than a million years. And that's because we have stuff that we like track from uh, lake deposits, for example, that have pollen preserved in them. And pollen, because it's ubiquitous and widespread, um, can indicate whether you have uh, like pine trees, for example, versus uh, grasses that are dominate at different times when it's warmer or cooler. We have more direct evidence from oxygen isotopes in like ice cores that tell us uh, what the composition, the CO2 levels and the oxygen levels of the atmosphere were at the time that that gas bubble in the ice was formed. And we have direct evidence from rocks from glacial deposits, like how far the glaciers, ice caps, have expanded or retreated. So this is things like, you know, where the moraines are, where the glacial erratics are, um, striations, which I, I realize I forgot to talk about. But basically, they're just like scrapes along rocks that glaciers uh, go over that indicate, like, the orientation of the, the glacier movement. So how this all comes into play with between the link between temperature and uh, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere is the carbon cycle. So the carbon cycle is just how carbon is moved around within the earth and the different parts of the earth system. So this includes within biological organisms in the form of like hydrocarbons. Um, also, you know, fossil fuels when those organisms, if they're plankton or plants, get buried and 
and put into the ground. Um, in the atmosphere, there's naturally carbon dioxide present. Gases coming out of volcanoes have carbon dioxide and other uh, compounds. But the biggest, like, reservoir for carbon on the Earth, by far, are sedimentary rocks, specifically like limestones, right? So you see, like, the numbers down here are how many tons, I think gigatons, actually, yeah, gigatons of carbon are locked up in these different reservoirs. So fossil fuels are 4,000, which is, you know, quite a bit larger than the 750 in the atmosphere. But there's 80 million plus gigatons of carbon stored in limestone. And that is key. So, like I just said, carbon is sedimentary rocks, the carbonate rocks, which is the map here on the right, shows, you know, where all these things are in blue. And these are like shallow sea deposits for the most part. There's also limestones and deep sea carbonate oozes, or carbonate oozes in the deep sea, um, that are made out of like little skeletons of like things like coccoliths that, that make up like chalks and other uh, little planktonic organisms that make their skeletons out of carbonates, which are extremely important. Altogether, these carbonate rocks make up about 20% of sedimentary rocks overall, which is, you know, quite a bit. Now, the movement of carbon, like a single carbon atom, if you think about it, moving from one of these reservoirs to the other is termed the flux. And so you can move things from, say, the air, the atmosphere, to organisms via photosynthesis. You can move things from the organisms to the air via respiration, from biomass to rocks by burying the organisms, their skeletons, and from the air into the oceans by spontaneous gas exchange. So like carbon dioxide actually gets incorporated into water spontaneously. The thing that makes the carbon cycle unique compared to some other element cycles is that there are these big discrepancies in how long individual molecules or atoms stay in one part of the reservoir versus another, what's termed the residence time. So you think about like a single carbon, the average atom of carbon will only spend about five years in the atmosphere, maybe 10 years inside of an organism. But if it gets buried in a limestone or another carbonate rock, it may be in there for more than 10 million years. So if carbon gets locked away in a rock, it's typically there for a very, very long time, very long term process. All the other parts of the system are quite rapid comparatively speaking. Now, modern day, we want a lot of this carbon is soaked up, let's say at the surface, not considering limestones, in forest, for example. So if you think about biomass, the majority of biomass on the planet is in plants, because they're the base of the food chain, they probably pretty much have to be the most abundant organisms. And in fact, like the Amazon rainforest in particular, accounts for about 25% of the carbon dioxide that's captured by the land. It's like how much is stored in the land. Um, unfortunately, we've lost about a third of that capture ability over the last 30 years due to deforestation in the Amazon itself. And it's certainly going on in other parts of the world as well. Um, some regions of the world, though, are seeing reforesting going on. So like much of the United States, actually, we're regrowing. So that's what this dark green is is a net gain in forest over time. Uh, also, oh, what is that? Sweden up here in Finland, also showing large regrowth, parts of Europe, uh, Japan, but a lot of the developing world in like Africa and South America, um, Southeast Asia, Russia to even in Central Asia, like are seeing still pretty heavy deforestation. The ocean is the other big carbon sink where this stuff is sitting in the, in the Earth's surface. So most of the carbon dioxide that we've released in the form of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere has actually been absorbed by the oceans already and like buffered us somewhat from the effects of like temperature increase. But it's causing ocean acidification. So this is where the pH of the water is dropping. Um, and it's dropped by only 0.1, but pH is a logarithmic scale, so every, like the Richter scale, so every move down by one means a 10 times more acidic. So this 0.1 translates to about 25% more acidic oceans than they were, say, 150 years ago or so. And this has led to massive coral die-offs, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, further on in the lecture. 
So normally how the carbon cycle works is in this feedback loop that keeps kind of everything in check. Maybe over long time scales, maybe 100,000 years, but keeps things balanced out. So typically, let's say you have an increase in CO2 levels in the atmosphere. That could be from increase in volcanic eruptions even. But you have some increase. CO2 gets pumped out into the atmosphere uh, more than previously had been there, which means you get higher average temperatures, which means you get increased weathering of rocks, which then those weathering of those rocks, particularly from like the highlands and in the tropics, is going to bring ions that are normally rare out in the oceans. It's going to transport them via rivers. Um, so calcium, iron, lots of metals, zinc and stuff like that are being transported from the continents to the water. And then that produces a bloom of life. And then the large amount of dead organisms can then be buried into the earth in the forms of limestone deposits which then draws carbon out of rapid circulation because remember the limestone deposit once it's in there the carbon is in there it lasts it stays in there for usually several million years or more than 10 million years and so typically this might take like a hundred thousand years like i said for it to balance back out but it kept the carbon dioxide levels kind of in a steady range typically and bounced back and forth within that range so this is a diagram showing that same thing basically from geologist perspective so we have you know sources of stuff coming out from volcanoes uh, from co2 being pumped out and the co2 originating there is from say like limestones or other things where out in the oceans there the oceanic plates are eventually subducted and that stuff is burned off and ends up in the magma and rising up to the surface um, you have weathering of silicate rocks in the highlands that gets transported out into the oceans like i said and uh, causes a bloom in uh, organisms that then die, fall to the bottom of the ocean, and deposit as limestones. And the cycle starts over. So the problem is that we've disrupted that. So the burning of fossil fuels, this oil, gas, coal, the stuff that would usually be sitting down there for millions upon millions of years, we're taking it out and burning it and releasing a lot of that stored carbon dioxide and other compounds um, back into the atmosphere at rates that are 100 to 300 times greater than pre-industrial, and typically that means before like 1850 levels. And so that's way faster than that negative feedback loop that, that usually is in play can keep up with. And so this has led to a rapid rise in CO2 and to a runaway greenhouse effect. Um, and I'll tell you what the greenhouse effect is in a second. So this is our historical trend over here of CO2 over the past 400,000 years. And you can see it's, you know, this regular negative feedback loop in, in action here, right? So it takes about 100,000 years, drops, jumps, goes back up, drops, goes back up, drops, goes back up. And it always stays within this bound of, say, 180 to 300 uh, parts per million. It drops back down and starts to climb back up. And then you hit, you know, like 1950 and then the current levels. And I think this has actually maybe even reached over 400 recently. Um, so, like, it's not even that we're seeing a rise in carbon dioxide levels is the problem, it's how quickly it's occurring that is really the issue here. We're warming the planet at an unprecedented rate. So this effect, as I've alluded to, is basically that some gases act as kind of like a blanket for the atmosphere. So typically, when the sun, sun's rays shine on the Earth, they bring energy with them, um, that energy makes its way to the Earth's surface where it's absorbed and then re-radiated in the form of heat. Typically a lot of that heat then is lost and flies out into space and that's how like the Earth cools itself essentially. But the greenhouse gases essentially prevent the gas, or sorry, that re-radiated heat from escaping and instead like cause it to bounce back and forth in uh, our atmosphere and trap it there with the net effect being that the whole planet warms over time. And so this is a climate change visual showing like how temperatures have changed over time, where each one of these little bars is a country of the world, um, and then how far out they are from the center is their temperature relative to the uh, 1951 to 1980 average temperature. So starting from 1900, I'm going to play this little animation. So going from, you know, 19, early 1900s, everything seems to be about average here. Europe's getting some heat spikes 
and it's really going to start to pick up and get extreme once we hit the 80s and beyond. Starting to see a lot more red. So it gets pretty extreme here at the end. So this goes to 2016. So you can see by 2016 here, we're out at most of the world is basically on average at least a degree Celsius warmer. And in many cases, a degree and a half. And in some places, even you know two degrees Celsius warmer than it had been um, for the 1951 to 1980 average. That was you know 100 years past when we had really started to pump out a lot of greenhouse gases um, during the Industrial Revolution. So that baseline is already a little bit higher than the historical average. So some arguments about people have made arguments before that okay maybe that we acknowledge climate change or like global warming as a thing but we don't think it's humans causing it. Of course there are some people who still say that. But so one of these things is that you know there are changes in in Earth's distance from the Sun due to the eccentricity of the orbit, the tilt of the planet which wobbles a little bit back and forth in this thing called precession. Um, the problem is based on all those things like we should actually be moving back toward an ice age right now compared to instead of continuing to warm like we're on we were at the tip of kind of like an ice age uh, interglacial we should be moving back the other way and probably getting cooler again if the normal pattern and regulation uh, was in effect, and we're obviously not seeing that. So that doesn't match up. The other thing is that there's solar radiation. So the sun kind of cyclically increases and decreases its output every on 10 to 15 year cycles. Um, honestly, I don't understand why at this point, but it's not important really for our purposes. But it does do this. But if that was causing the warming, we should see temperature swings matching with the cycles of, you know, the temperature that we have from the rock record or from other evidence, and and they don't. They just don't match up. And so this doesn't seem to be driving it either. So in fact, greenhouse gases, we're pretty confident, are responsible for at least 90% of the current warming trend. Um, this map just shows like how much the temperature has changed relative to 1950 temperatures, average global temperature. You can see there, there's very few places where it's actually gotten cooler, some parts of like the Antarctic, but the Arctic in particular is warming up very quickly. Um, it's already warmed up like two and a half degrees relative to 1950, which is startlingly fast. And so it's not like this is even evenly distributed in space. Like some areas are going to be hit harder faster than others, and the Arctic is, is being hit the hardest first. So there are four main culprits for greenhouse gases. You have carbon dioxide, which is the one pretty much everybody's probably heard of, CO2. You have methane, which is unfortunately 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Like for every pound of carbon dioxide you have, um, or every pound of rather every pound of methane you have, it's worth 25 pounds of carbon dioxide for the purpose of like trapping heat on the Earth's surface. Nitrous oxides. Uh, it's almost 300 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and then fluorinated gases are between you know 675 to two, more than 22,000 times more potent. So they're particularly bad. Thankfully, these like things basically get rarer as you go down this list from carbon dioxide to fluorinated gases. Now, in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide by far makes up the vast majority of the greenhouse gases that are there. Um, methane makes up like 16.3%, but remember it's 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas, so if you adjust for that, methane is still, and nitrous oxide as well, since it's 300 times more powerful, are extremely potent as greenhouse gases. But just by sheer volume of like molecules, carbon dioxide wins out, hands down. And in terms of like how much of this stuff is being pumped out today, um, we're continuing to increase how much we're putting out. It doesn't seem to have, you know, tapered off really much at all. Um, this is a chart on the left is showing its growth over time. Most of the increase in greenhouse gases currently is due to increases in Asia, um, from mostly India and China, which are, you know, massive, literally more than a billion people in each countries that are growing rapidly and industrializing rapidly. Um, there is a good sort of good news, right, that, like, here's the world, 
population or per capita consumption, so per person consumption of greenhouse gases or emission of greenhouse gases for the world. So overall, each person is not putting out more greenhouse gases than they are, you know, or they have been in the past. It's been fairly stable over the past 40 years. Um, again, it's not evenly distributed, so it's across the whole planet. So places that are more developed tend to consume more per person than areas that are less developed. But at least we're not, you know, increasing consumption uh, rapidly, like, per person as well. Unfortunately, like, the population of the planet is growing, and so even though each per person is not, is using the same amount, that still means we're pumping out more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases over time. And there doesn't seem to be, it's really hard to see how that's going to change in the near future, although I really hope it does. Now, in terms of the drivers of climate change, in the U.S., like, this is government, this is data on the chart over here on the right from the EPA. Um, transportation and electricity account for, like, the two biggest contributors to greenhouse gases. So this is, like, electricity is the burning of, like, coal primarily for uh, power generation. Um, transportation, so, you know, just driving cars around and stuff. Industry use, agriculture use 9%, and then commercial and residential use 11%. So, like, for example, if I were to drive to UB instead of having this remote version of the course... My car emits about just under 300 grams per mile of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases. So that means I'm putting out on a round trip to Geneseo from my house, because I live pretty far away, about 77 pounds of greenhouse gases, which, you know, not great. Um, would be better if I, you know, could avoid that. But <laughs> this is the real, one of the things that makes tough hard is that, dude, in, there are economic realities um, on day-to-day -day life that matter. Now, agriculture only makes up 9% of, you know, the total greenhouse gas emissions, but it would be a lot less if greenhouse gases that agriculture emitted were mostly carbon dioxide, because they're not. In fact, uh, agriculture contributes to a bunch of different ways to greenhouse gases, so they do contribute to CO2 being released by the clearing of land for agriculture. It's because plants normally act as carbon storage, so even if you just, you know, keep land cleared through the season where there aren't plants growing where there usually would be, that's going to kind of act as a or loss of a carbon sink, which means more is in the atmosphere probably. Um, you also release a lot of methane if you're doing uh, livestock rearing, both because you have to grow the plants, which means clearing of land, to uh, grow the feed for the organ for the you know cows or chickens or pigs or whatever, but also cows, and which are ruminants, um, themselves like reduce or give off a lot of methane just by the way that their digestive systems uh, work and their dung releases a t like way 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 more methane than you really want to know about um, and then finally they also agriculture also contributes to uh, nitrous oxide greenhouse gas which is like a 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide remember from both synthetic and organic fertilizers so, in the U.S., uh, agriculture accounts for about 69 of, of the nitrous oxide emissions in the country. Oh, I forgot about that part. So, if you do the math on the methane, um, the cows put out somewhere between 65 to 130 gallons a day per cow, and there's about a billion and a half cows in the United States, which means you're putting out 97 and a half billion gallons a day of methane just from cows, which is insane. Now, the Earth did have some capacity to kind of a buffer against the effects of increased greenhouse gases, but we've probably surpassed that point sometime around 1900. So that's what this chart over here is showing, is that the purple line is the net flux into the atmosphere, and like the brown line is the total uh, carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas equivalents that we're putting into the uh, atmosphere. So... Prior to 1900, the Earth was basically able to accommodate our greenhouse gas emissions, but over the past 100 and almost 20 years at this point, like, we've far outstripped the Earth's ability to absorb stuff. And so now it's getting, you know, really out of hand. So we're both, both because we're increasing carbon output, so we're, you know, there's more people using more resources than ever before, and because we're cutting down forests, we're, uh, other processes were actually decreasing carbon sinks as well, so we're making it worse on both sides. 
one ex so a couple examples of like what the effects have been now. So ice is melting, obviously, because increased temperatures, and particularly in the Arctic, because the temperature has already increased there really quickly. Um, projections are that there might be no Arctic sea ice, in fact, by the summer in the summer by 2040. So in the next 20 years, there may be the fabled Northwest Passage. If you guys ever remember learning about that or talking about that in like middle school or or something. Um, that you could like sail through the Arctic Ocean, like basically across the North Pole for shipping and stuff like that, may be a real possibility. And in fact, like Canada, um, North America, and Russia in particular are aggressively like making claims to the Arctic area because there are potentially mineral resources like oil, gas, and also gold um, that may become accessible because of the melting ice. So there's this unfortunate ne or positive feedback loop in this case um, as the ice melts. So as you melt the ice caps and mountain glaciers, you expose the land underneath, which is darker. So dark surfaces absorb more heat and create, and so when you absorb more heat, now the land heats up, which makes it easier to melt more of the glacier, which then exposes more land, which then increases the temperature and the absorption rate, which, you know, positive feedback loop. So as this is carrying on, like the glaciers are melting, they're melting faster and faster and faster over time. So this process is, is a runaway feedback loop and partially probably why like the Arctic is, is going to melt faster and melting faster than, than maybe we would expect otherwise. It's also, as um, the discussion for last week, well, one of the things that you, some people talked about, and correctly so, is that like the melting of these ocean, or these glaciers, is introducing uh, lots of fresh water and uh, disrupting ocean currents in the uh, out there. So the most famous or relevant one to us, and and particularly like the Western world, is the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Current Circulation (AMOC). So this is the current that runs from the Gulf of Mexico to Western Europe. This is what keeps Spain subtropical, England temperate, and Norway habitable at all, basically. And there's evidence that this AMOC current is weakening due to the input of fresh water from melting glaciers and increased open ocean temperatures, which tend to make circulation more sluggish. So there's been a 15% reduction in strength since 1950, according to research, and that's the weakest it's been in over the last 1,600 years, as far as the research was able to tell. So, just as, you know, how this thing is important here, so this is the current that basically runs like this. So it goes down here, grabs some warm water, and then goes back up along the west coast of Europe. So Spain, if you look here, is subtropical essentially habitat, but like it's pretty much like northern Spain is the same latitude as New York, which certainly is not subtropical. We have a you know a climate that's more similar to England, which is you know way up here relatively speaking, and. If you go left from there, like west from there, like that's like Nova Scotia, you know, over here region. Like literally almost nobody lives or it's very sparsely populated because it's too darn cold to to be there. Whereas over here, it's, you know, fine. So if we lose this uh, current, it could potentially be pretty nasty. This is the kind of, actually the plot line for um, a natural disaster movie from back in like 2003, I think, or something. It's almost probably none of you have seen it called The Day After Tomorrow. Yeah, so this is just showing that same current here, and and where it is, and where it carries water around. All right. In terms of more local, um, the warming temperatures across the planet, including around here, are expected to shorten winter by two to four weeks within the next hundred years, which, you know, depending on what your view of winter is, may be a positive, um, but it does also overall weaken the season, so you're going to get a wetter spring and fall, for example. Um, and in fact, under like the worst scenarios, we're seeing like the seasons shift or like the, the winter might shrink by like an entire month, for example. By the way, this higher scenario down here, so this is going from like best case scenario down to worst case scenario. The worst case scenario right now, like all the models that have worst case scenario, are the if we do nothing. Like if we carry on business as usual. Not if we like make things worse, but if we just let things go as they are and don't take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That is the worst case scenario that most of these models are operating under, if you see any. Now, in addition to temperature, that also has effect on precipitation. So overall, a warmer planet means more precipitation, and we're already seeing kind of extremes of that. So we're going to get both 
uh, overall precipitation is going to go up, but there's going to be longer dry periods and more intense short storms. So it's not like it's going to be just a little bit more rain over the course of the year. When it does rain, it's going to rain buckets and dump more often, and then you're going to have long drought periods in between. So in the Northeast, we're expected to get more rain, and most of like the Midwest are expected to get more rain. Um, whereas in the Southwest, actually, it's supposed to dry up, which is not great for them. So this is the percent, this chart here is a percent change in precipitation from 1901 to 1960 average today. So like uh, Western New York and Geneseo area has experienced like a 10 to 15 percent increase in precipitation from the first half of the 20th century, relatively speaking. So already like this is something that that is noticeable. Um, I was just thinking back actually, so I had somebody asked me in one of my classes once, like if I had noticed over the course of my life changes in due to climate change, and the most, the one that has always jumped out at me, which I should have mentioned last, last slide, is that early, in, like in my childhood, living in the Buffalo area, during the winter, there was a good solid two and a half months, basically from late December till sometime in mid-February typically, where there were several feet of snow on the ground that whole time period. And that almost never happens anymore. There hasn't, I don't think there's, there's been one what I would consider like kind of normal um, winter over the past 10 years in the Buffalo area where we had snow consistently on the ground. Now it's more these temperature swings where we get these big storms dump a ridiculous amount of snow on us and then it melts over the course of the next couple of days or week um, and leaves dry, bare, you know, grass. And then it does the same thing happens over again. So that's one of the changes that I've noticed in personally in my life, the one that's that's stuck out most to me. So these precipitation changes mean that you're gonna have, you know, an increased risk of floods, which we're also seeing currently still in the Midwest right now, as I'm recording this, um, and the increased persistence of drought conditions in like the Southwest in particular, where there's already a problem, right? So this is a projected changes in rainfall. Um, across the seasons, you know, over in the latter half of this uh, century, assuming greenhouse gas emissions continue to increase, basically business as usual. So, you know, in parts of the southwest and or in like, uh, even in the northwest, actually, you're looking at precipitation changes of like minus 30%, which is pretty substantial, considering they're already under extreme water stress in many cases. This also means that you get more wildfires, because if you have um, these intense bouts of, say, like, heavy downpours that the plants go, oh, great, food and water, like, and spring into life and bloom and go nuts growing, but then there's droughts. And so what that means is that the plants die off and they just leave all this dry tinder on the surface, which means you're going to, when a fire does happen, it's going to burn more intensely and a larger area than it has previously, and that's what we're seeing, in fact, today. So even estimates, like this is a chart showing the estimates of wildfires without climate change and with climate change, and essentially, as of like 2015 at least, like there are basically twice as many wildfires, um, well this is by the acres burned, so twice as, twice as large an area is being burned today as it, as it would have been if climate change was not like a thing. Also affects other systems that you might not expect, so like Tornado Alley, which is typically kind of in the Midwest area, there's some evidence that it may actually be shifting. Um, it's probably likely that tornadoes overall will actually increase because you need a certain amount of energy in the atmosphere to actually cause tornado, and that's heat. So, I mean, there was just a, and still is, a pretty frequent cluster of tornadoes has been happening, again, in the Midwest, but it seems like there's some evidence that it's going to be shifting east as the globe warms um, into places that haven't had to historically deal with them very much. Not like, you know, over to us, but like a little further to the east. The problem is that there's not a lot of historical data of tornadoes and occurrences to kind of like base this off of. Um, we don't have a good baseline for like how frequent or exactly where they occur. Because prior to like 30 years ago, we just didn't have the technology or the, the people. Like people didn't just have their, you know, cell phones that could record these things every time they popped up everywhere, and they'd only last, like, a, you know, a couple minutes, typically. Uh, hurricanes is another case of weather and that's um, being affected by climate change. So warming temperatures actually might decrease the number of overall hurricanes, 
which seems like a good thing, probably is, except it comes with the caveat that the hurricanes that do occur are expected to become stronger on average. So if you think about this as like a distribution, where normally the distribution, if we go from category one on the left to the right, you're going to go one is the most frequent, and then two is a little less frequent, three, four, five. So they decrease in frequency as they get stronger. What's going to happen, it looks like, is that category one is going to stay constant, category three is going to decrease, and category four and five, the strongest, are going to increase. So instead we're going to get this U-shaped distribution. Um, so like Hurricane Harvey, which hit... Oh, God. I can't think of numbers. The years. Anyway, a couple of years ago, um, was a category four storm and, you know, did substantial damage. So these things, type of large-scale ones, are, are likely to become more frequent, which is not great. And an increasing number of people are living along, like, coastlines and in cities along coastlines, so they're, more li they're likely to be more damaging as time goes on as well. The other thing that's going to be a problem is that crops are going to suffer. So as CO2 levels increase, plants theoretically and do grow better under high CO2 conditions because they use it for photosynthesis. They take in the carbon dioxide like we take in oxygen. But all those other changes like increasing precipitation, temperature swings, those things basically wipe out any of the gains in growth from CO2 emissions um, and leads to a net loss. So over the near future, corn, maize in, in this table here, and uh, wheat are both supposed to take a hit of, you know, two and a half to four percent of total production, um, which is not great. Like, it doesn't seem like a whole lot, but, but like, those are the two staple crops of, you know, a good chunk of the world. Um, rice and soybeans actually increase a little bit. Rice in particular does well because it's actually, uh, wild rice is evolved in wet, humid, hot areas, so it's kind of pre-adapted uh, to a warmer, soggier world. Soybeans, I'm not exactly, I can't remember what the case is there. I think it opens up new areas that are, that were not accessible previously for soybean farming. But anyway, like we're seeing a net decrease in, in production looking like over in the near future, which is particularly bad because there are also projections that were by 2050, our food production is not looking, the our current food production is increasing year over year, like we're producing more food from the same amount of land year over year, but it's not increasing fast enough to keep up with the growing population. And so by 2050, it's projected that there will, the amount of food that we're producing will be outstripped by the demand for, for people. Um, and the effects of climate change are going to exacerbate that problem. So there's also biodiversity lost. So as of right now, we only know of a single species that has gone extinct as a direct result of climate change. It's this little mouse called the Bramble K. Melamis. Melamese, I'm not actually sure how to say that one. Um, but basically it lived on a little coral island uh, off the coast of Australia, and so the sea level rise drowned out the island, essentially. And so it's gone. But it's estimated that uh, 15 to 37 percent of species over the long term, under various climate change scenarios, are likely to... to go extinct. And this is just because they're going to be, their populations are going to drop to a point uh, that they'll just eventually go extinct if nothing is done, basically. Like, even though it might not cause them to go extinct in five years, they'll basically be on a downward spiral to extinction over the near future. And this is just based on the loss of habitable area, basically the, how, how much their habitats are shrinking from sea level rise, from temperature, uh, and climate shifts around them. That's a basically like, you know, up, upward like of a third of species on the planet are at risk, which is pr like approaching extinct mass extinction levels. And part of this is because the climate is shifting really quickly. I mentioned this, that the thing that's different today than with the past is that climate has changed the past pretty dramatically and to the effect of causing mass extinctions, but we're increasing the temperature far, far more quickly than at any time in the geologic history of the Earth, as far as we can tell. So right now, about 29% of plant species are, are expected to be too slow to spread. Like, they can't keep up as the climate shifts around them. Potentially, like, organisms could, you know, basically follow what their ideal conditions are. Animals, some animals are pretty mobile and would be able to do that. But plants are typically less mobile because you have to, you can only 
usually move via intergenerational like seed dispersal. Um, and so, you know, 29% of plant species are, are can't spread fast enough. Uh, and this is, that estimate is even under optimal conditions like where there's no barriers to dispersal from like cities, cities being in between patches of habitable land or, you know, mowing lawns and stuff like that. In some cases, these are quite fast. So we're talking about like the climate is shifting in some places like 10 kilometers per year that these are moving. In some cases, you just, you can't move. Like if you're here just south of the Himalayan mountains in India, like you you can't disperse over if you live in this area that that climate is different than like the Himalayas. You can't just travel you know across the Himalayas to get to a new patch of good land, even if it exists over there, because there's a freaking mountain range in the way. So you're kind of stuck. And this isn't evenly distributed by like different habitat types, right? So. All of these are basically how fast the different habitat types are moving per year. So some are slower, some are faster. So like tropical and subtropical coniferous rainforests are moving quite slowly. So organisms can probably keep up for the most part with those. Whereas uh, flooded grasslands and savannas are moving very rapidly overall. Now I told you to wrap back to this one. So I mentioned ocean acidification is making the, is increasing the or sorry, decreasing the pH of the oceans. It has gone down by about 25% since 1900. This is particularly damaging to coral reefs because coral reefs are made out of calcium carbonate skeletons. Now, as you increase the, or sorry, if you increase the acidity of the water, that then reacts with the coral's carbonate skeleton and just tries to dissolve it. So it makes it harder for the coral to maintain its skeleton. And the other thing that's coming into play here is that the oceans are warming, and so corals are, as far as we can tell, for the most part, are already living close to their thermal maximum. They're already living near the maximum temperatures that they're able to handle. And so that combination of temperature increase and ocean acidification means that you get this phenomenon called coral bleaching, where basically the corals, as a response to that, those stresses, will eject their these organisms that are their symbiotic partners um, called zooxanthellae that perform photosynthesis and provide the coral with energy. And once they go bleaching, most of the corals that bleach die off. And this has a knock-on effect because coral reefs are an extremely important um, center of biodiversity. And like coral reefs cover, I think it's two or three percent of the, the plant's surface but account for 25% of all the marine species live specifically on or depend on uh, coral reef environments. And these bleaching events are started back in like the 1980s, I think is the first widely recognized one. Since like the mid to late 2000s, they've become basically close to annual. They're becoming more and more frequent and, and essentially annual now. I mean, there was a 2005 bleaching event that killed off half of all the corals that were living in the Caribbean. That's terrifying. So by the, like 2050, like coral reefs will, as we know them now at least, will basically probably cease to exist. Um, uh, which is a pretty sad thought. And then unfortunately, like because of that delay in time between when things, like the carbon goes into the atmosphere and, and how the effects are seen, like even if we were to stop pumping out greenhouse gases tomorrow, that would that is almost certainly going to happen regardless of what we do. Like the coral reefs are already on the way out for the most part. It also spreads this thing called chytrid fungus. So this is a fungus that grows in the skin of amphibians. It, it creates this like thickened skin that kind of sloughs off sometimes, causes them to be in like a lethargic state, and eventually leads to death. Um, it's widespread in amphibians, known to have infected more than 700 species, and it's responsible for 168 extinctions itself, 100 since 1980, over the past, you know, well, 40 years now at this point. The spread and vulnerability of amphibians is correlated with climate change, not necessarily being because it's warmer, but it appears to be temperature swings and cooler local temperatures are actually what's allowing the fungus to uh, spread in this case. But this is pretty devastating to the amphibian community. Independent of those, like, cases there which are pretty terrifying themselves. The other major point of, of concern is that if we look back in the geologic record, we see that 
pretty much all of the mass extinctions that have occurred in the past are associated with major uh, climate change events, either cooling or uh, heating up. So like the Ordovician mass extinction event, which is one of the ones that I worked on um, during my master's and PhD work, was a cooling event where it had been really warm and then there was a mass glaciation event, whereas the N-Permian mass extinction, which was the largest mass extinction in Earth's history, had a 6 to 10 degrees Celsius increase in uh, global temperatures, which you know were on track to achieve pretty quickly. And in that case, about 90% or so of species went extinct, which, you know, if that's the direction we're trending, is should be a worrying in and of itself, independent of anything else even. So from historic, well, geologic records, that's not a good sign. And in fact, if we look at the, just as a comparison, the last time the Earth was as warm or warmer than it is currently, uh, saw like a massive warming trend, was about 56 million years ago during this, what's termed the Paleo-Eocene Thermal Maximum, P-E-T-N. And this was a rise in global temperature of 5 to 8 degrees over the course of 20,000 years. This is showing like the temperature change relative to uh, the 1950 baseline of land and sea. And, you know, we're talking about like a 12, 10, 12 degree increase in temperature um, in, this, in the oceans, for example, which is a lot. And on the land, we're talking about like 20 degrees Celsius, which is pretty nastier. Oh, sorry, that is the, the temperature. Right. So... The last time we saw this warming trend, there were tropical forests as far north as Wyoming. Uh, there were no polar ice caps at all, and there are reptiles found in Greenland, where the other summer temperature today is about 45 degrees. So there are no reptiles in Greenland today, because it's too cold. Um, this picture on the right here is a reconstruction of what like Wyoming looked like at the time. So this like swampy, subtropical forest, um, with this whole fauna of like peccaries and piggy, pig-like things and, and all sorts of weird stuff that, that just would seem foreign in Wyoming today. Um, so this was a very different world uh, compared to what we think of right now, but we're heading in that direction. Not that we'll probably see tropical forests in Wyoming because we'll cut them down if they try to grow there, but that's what it is. Uh, there was some winners in this, like we are one of those winners during this event, so primates, because forests were expanding at this time, uh, expanded rapidly, and like this was like kind of the heyday for primates as a group, like they were the highest species diversity they ever achieved at that time. But there were massive die-offs of plankton in the oceans around the equator, so basically like it was too hot at the equator for organisms to live, and it became almost like a dead zone area. So that's what this guy holding the core here, um, he didn't like get it wet or color it. The the color is depend like that line where the color changes is the Paleocene thermal maximum, and that change in color is due to the amount of organic material that's in the in the core. Um, and the other thing is that like large coral reefs disappear from the rock record for millions of years, almost certainly due to ocean acidification. Um, so coral reefs are have existed and and been stressed in the past and come back, but the last time it warmed up as rapidly, even close to as rapidly as it is right now, it took millions of years for them to fully recover. So just to put things in perspective here, during the PETM, if you do some quick math, it means that over 20,000 years, the temperature increase was about 0 0.004 degrees Celsius per century. The estimates being that they put out about 1.7 billion metric tons of carbon per year. Today, we're looking at an increase of 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius per century, and we're putting out 9.8 billion metric tons of carbon per year. And actually, like, the do-nothing scenario is looking even worse in some cases, where we might get to up, up to even 6 degrees Celsius by 2100. So the question is, what can we actually do to, like, try and, and you know, reduce greenhouse gases? Um, we can cut back on food waste, because it turns out like we end up throwing out about 30 to 40 percent of the food that we buy maybe because it goes bad because we let it expire before you know we get to use it uh, for whatever reason like we throw out about a third of our total food which then goes to a landfill breaks down releases methane um, and if you like uh, if you count like food waste as like its own country 
the amount of carbon or uh, greenhouse gases that it puts out, it counts as third. So it's China, the USA, and then food waste as the third largest country um, contributor of greenhouse gases. So cutting back on food waste would be a very helpful thing to do. Cutting back on the proportion of meat in the diet is also something that's is a lifestyle change for many people, myself included, um, but do, could have a substantial effect on greenhouse gases that you can take personally. So like cutting out beef in particular can decrease your personal carbon footprint by like 20%, say, which is a lot. Um, and then carpooling or using public transit whenever possible, which is unfortunately not very easy to do in this part of the country or in like rural areas. But if it's available to you, it's much better than driving alone. Other things you can do is cut back on electricity usage because that's mostly coming from, say, uh, coal, for example. Um, and like turning down your thermostats if you don't need it and putting on extra layers during the winter instead of turning up the thermostat whenever possible. Unplug what are called vampire appliances. So these are things like um, game systems, TVs that are kind of always just like have like the little red light that's on, for example. All those little things, if you unplug them, like you not only save a bunch of energy, like greenhouse gas wise, but you also save some money if you're having to pay, you know, your own electric bill. Um, if you recycle and buy green products, although that gets dicey telling whether it's actually helpful or not, honestly. Um, and then probably one of the most important things you can do is, if you care about this issue, is to, to be politically active and vote in representatives that take climate change seriously, because a lot of these, well, these are personal actions that you can take, a lot of stuff is beyond any individual's control, and you need larger scale um, actions to combat the problem. So one of the things that we'll talk about is our final lecture will be on alternative energy sources that we can use instead of greenhouse gas emitting uh, fossil fuels.